next Sunday, immediately after our service, we're going to have our, this says, brief but always entertaining annual church financial meeting. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many financial meetings that you've gone to that were entertaining, but it seems like ours always wind up being that way. It couldn't be because our uh, head of the deacons is Garth Griffith. I don't know if that has anything to do with it or how we do it. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, we're going to have our uh, communion Sunday next, next Sunday with our fellowship dinner that will follow. And while we're, we usually wait a little while for them to get completely set up, we'll have our uh, financial meeting at that time. One of the things that's not in the bulletin is that we're not going to have our uh, fun Friday uh, this Friday. We have a short month and we're going to have communion Sunday and our fellowship Sunday in a day after the fellowship uh, of the fun Friday rather. So we decided to cancel it for this month, but we'll continue it as we usually do in March. Let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer. And during that time, we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that we are able to learn and grow. We recognize that the life after this one is dependent on what we do and what we, the choices we make in this life. And we've made a good choice this morning to be here to focus on your mighty word. So we pray that you will help us to inculcate, metabolize the spiritual things that we will be going over today. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, We, a couple of us went to the men's prayer breakfast in Houston, at West Houston Bible Church uh, yesterday. And Dr. Oren Hempel was the key speaker and he was focusing on Obamacare and given a, uh, this law from a doctor's perspective. And it was very interesting. I learned uh, quite a bit. And I'm not going to bore you with the details right now. I think a lot of you pretty well have summed up what it's like uh, or what it's going to be like. But he gave us a handout that I thought that you might find interesting. It shows how simple uh, Obamacare really is. Excuse me, the Affordable Care Act. Um, I don't know how well you can see from there, but this is uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Over here you have the President. Over here you have the Congress. You have the IRS here. Uh, I believe this is the patient here. And here uh, here are some physicians and a conglomerate. Kind of looks like a computer chip or something. I don't know. But anyway, I uh, thought you might be interested in seeing that. If you want a copy, we'll email it to you or give you a printed copy so you can study that and give a report next Sunday. <coughs> yes. I shouldn't say things like that because somebody's going to take me seriously. <laughs> I'm not going, back. <laughs> not going back to that. Okay, we're going to continue this morning with our star series. And we are presently in the constellation of Pisces George if you want to kill the lights overhead so they can see a little better (coughs) Pisces is the seventh of the twelve constellations in the zodiac and here are the constellations in this band remember each there's 12 constellations, and each constellation has thir- takes up 30 de- degrees space along the ecliptic or the zodiac, which is 
the invisible arc that goes across the sky where the sun, the moon, and all the planets, so forth, are in that area. And so this 30 degrees of that, of that arc is called Pisces. And we've gone over some of this already. And we have um, the, the fish here that represent the uh, Israel, essentially, here. And we have and, and the band. This is actually two different constellations. And I'm warm in here. Y'all warm? Can somebody crank up the AC some? Because I'm coming out of this coat pretty soon if it, I put a sweatband on or something. So here we have the band is another constellation. Then we have Andromeda. And then we have up here uh, Cephas. And so actually Pisces, the fish here, is the main constellation. And then the other three constellations accompany it and help tell the story of this um, constellation. And the band represents something, you notice it's tied to the uh, fish's tail, and means that there's something about being bo uh, in bondage or bound. And here we have Andromeda, that essentially you see the same thing. Here, this is a woman, and you see the chains on her feet and hands here. And you'll also notice that the uh, chains are broken. And so it, it, has, it has something to do with uh, being in bondage or affliction and then uh, being delivered from that. So we were talking about this last Sunday regarding the bondage. And what we saw is that uh, there are various things that show uh, Israel in bondage. And I need to bring up one more thing here. Um, Israel was in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. She was in bondage in um, Babylon for 70 years. And the uh, next slide I'm going to show you is going to show you what I think is the uh, the, the most significant uh, adversity, uh, trials, tests that Israel had so far. You all remember uh, this timeline. Show it to you uh, one more time. This is the grain here is the age of the Jews. The cross, of course, is uh, when Christ made his atonement for our sins. And 50 days after his resurrection was the day of Pentecost. That was around 33 A.D. And then 70 years, or about uh, 37 years later, uh, you had the what's known as diaspora. Some people pronounce it the di diaspora. This is when Rome came and sacked uh, Jerusalem. The city was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and the Israelites were dispersed throughout the entire earth. And this was prophesied. I have a few verses here. Jeremiah 16, 13. Ezekiel 5:10, Daniel 9:26, Matthew 24:2, and Luke 19:23 through 24 are a few of the uh, prophecies that said that Israel was going to experience what we call the fifth cycle of discipline. In Deuteronomy 26, it gives the five cycles of discipline that a nation would go through, and Israel finally had uh, gone so far into degeneracy and being disobedient to God that he. Uh, Lord the hammer, in other words, he, his wrath and judgment was poured out on them and they were dispersed throughout the entire earth. For 19, over 1900 years, there was no nation. There, the, the Jews had no capital city. Uh, they were not recognized as a nation by anybody. In fact, most of the people thought that it was in, impossible for Israel to again become a nation. However, God had prophesied it in many places. We'll look at this in just a moment. Uh, Isaiah 66, 6 through 9, said that Israel was going to be reborn again as a nation overnight. But this happened in uh, 19, uh, May 14, 1948. And this is the first phase of the regathering. G uh, the Jews, according to the scriptures, 
were going to be regathered in two phases after they were spread out throughout all the earth. Phase one, like I said, was uh, May 14, 1948, and the Jews are regathered in Israel as, as essentially a nation that uh, is, is still in unbelief. They still reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And then I have all these verses here that have to do with this particular uh, event, this historical event that was in 1948. Now we don't know how long we are, it's going to be until the church age ends, the rapture occurs. Uh, I think, let's see how close I can hold this. I think we might be right about there. And that's as, as still as I can hold it. But I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's very interesting. One thing that we know for sure is that Israel had to become a nation before the Antichrist could make a covenant or a contract or a treaty with it, with the nation of Israel, to begin the seven years of the tribulation, which, come, which occurs right here. You notice I have a little black area here. We don't know how long after we are raptured, after the Lord comes and takes us back home, that the tribulation is going to begin. It could be just a very short time. It could be a year or more, maybe. But we do know that when the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel, see that there has to be the nation Israel in existence then, that's what's going to start that seven-year clock ticking. And we know this from Daniel chapter 9. I won't digress into that into Daniel's 70th weeks. But God has already prophesied that from the issuing of a decree from Artaxerxes, this is in Nehemiah chapter 2, that there was going to be 490 years left of Israel. And we know from that same chapter in Daniel chapter 9 that 283 of those years have already passed. The last seven years is going to be the tribulation uh, which the Jews are going to experience the last seven years of that 490 years before Jesus Christ returns at the second advent. And when he returns at the second advent, that's going to be the phase two of the regathering of Israel. And that's prophesied, and, and that this is, they will be a believing nation then. In fact, the only people that are going to be left on planet Earth when Christ returns are going to be believers because all unbelievers are going to experience the baptism of fire and they will be tossed into a compartment of hell called torments waiting for the great white throne uh, judgment for all unbelievers. And that will take place over here at the end of the millennium. But this Christ is going to set up his millennial kingdom and rule for a thousand years. So this is, this is showing you how uh, another example of what Pisces is, is signifying that Israel was in bondage. Remember the, the two fish have their tails tied to a band? The woman has her hands and feet chained. But they're broken because all this is going to come to an end when Christ returns at the second advent. Very important here that I have in yellow, this box here. There's no prophecy fulfilled for the church uh, during the church age. In other words, the Old Testament, none of the prophets had a clue that, there, that God was going to temporarily set Israel aside. And then there was going to be a new creature, a new, uh, according to... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says we are a new creation in Christ. They had no idea that this was going to take place. A unique dispensation which we are in. And there's no prophecy for it. Other than when it starts and when it ends. When the rapture occurs. But there is prophecy fulfilled for Israel during the church age. This was fulfilled during the church age. This was fulfilled during the church age. And there's several other prophecies that are also fulfilled if you want to look research this go to our website and look up Israel regathered and click on the notes or you can listen to the um, to the audio um, you won't find this this timeline there though uh, you'll find other timelines but not this one because I prepared this one just for this star series of how Pisces is telling us something is showing us in the stars, that God's plan will be fulfilled. And even though Israel had gone out as a nation all these uh, centuries still, he's got a plan for them. And we're going to see in a few moments also that um, he, he has not forget, forgotten Israel. 
and he will fulfill the four unconditional covenants that he, had, he has uh, made to them. I won't read this again. Oop. Well, this is a uh, reborn in a day. This is just essentially explaining that uh, when Israel is going to be reborn as a nation, that there's not going to be any suffering prior to the birth. There's going to be the birth, and then there's going to be the suffering, which is unique. Who ever heard of such a thing? And yet that's exactly how Israel, May 14, 1948, was born. All the suffering, all the travail occurred after it became a nation. The very next day, there was five Arab nations that uh, attacked Israel. And nobody thought they had a chance. And yet, God's word continues to be fulfilled. And Israel isn't going anywhere. And we know this from another scripture that we went over for a period here. Um, this is uh, Isaiah 11, 11 through 2, uh, excuse me, 11 through 12. And it will happen on that day, talking about the second advent, that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people, referring to the believing Jews. And then he goes on and he says from all these areas, down here is very important, from the four corners of the earth. The only time that the, these prophecies could relate to Israel's history is after they were dispersed in 70 A.D. Because they had been taken cap captive. They were in Egypt and then came back to, uh, to Israel. Uh, they were in Babylon and they returned to Israel. See, these are sp from specific countries. One country. But when it's talking about gathered from all over the earth, four corners of the earth, it's talking about after 70 A.D. when they had been dispersed, dispersed all over, they're going to be regathered in two phases. First of all, as an unbelieving nation in 1948, and then whenever the second advent is going to occur, then whatever Jews are still out and not living in Israel are going to be regathered again. Now, I'm sorry for going that fast, but that was just a review. So now we're going to pick it up with uh, continuing with... Uh, what, what we are studying in, I better go back so y'all can see. I feel a little bit like the, the guy behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz. I don't have a lot of levers, but there's a lot of uh, buttons. And the thing about uh, buttons, when you, when you push the wrong one on, <laughs> on the computer... Uh, you can you can pay for it. You have to pay for it sometimes. Okay. Now the band we said here again is um, the blow it up a little bit. Here is the band, which is a constellation uh, to itself, and the band is connected to Cetus. I'm going to dodge something here and come back to it. This is what Pisces looks like if you just connect the dots of the stars. And then you have two main stars that are shown here. You have Octa, the united, and it means the Jews and Gentiles are united in the church age because there's no distinction in the body of Christ. It doesn't have any racial distinction, no sexual distinction. Uh, no uh, society distinction of, of where you are, whether you're a slave or free, whether you're management or blue collar. None of these distinctions matter. And uh, the 12 tribes of Israel will be re reunited again at the second advent, which we were looking at a moment ago. A moment ago. And this is al Samaka, which is the upheld. God upholds his promises to deliver the Jews. You see, so many times we have people who think, well, when... The Jews were the motivating force behind Jesus being crucified. They had their Messiah executed. Then God just, it just, he, they just ripped it with God. And that God is through with Israel, permanently through with Israel. And now the church has taken over the spot where, where Israel once stood. That's called replacement theology and it is false. God still has promises yet to be fulfilled 
for Israel, and that's a few of the things that we're going to look at today, has to do with that, that even though Israel went into bondage and are, are, are dispersed, he still has a plan for them and he will regather them again. Here is uh, Pisces again. Here's the two fish. Here is the band. And the star here that's called... Um, see, I hit the wrong button again. Well, I was trying to show the error here. I'm going to try it one more time. Here is the star. It's called Al Alrisha, A-L-R-I-S-H-A. It's the band of the bridle that's connecting these, uh, these, these fish. And I've got a... Uh, a um, a PowerPoint to show you where that is connected, and I'm going to shut this down for just a second because I don't want to get you confused with some of the other things I've got going here. Yeah, here it is. Okay. All right. Here is again Pisces, the fish. Here's the band that comes down to this point right here, and this is. On, in the next set of constellations uh, of Aries, here's Aries, the lamb here, or the ram, has his foot on this, and this is significant here as well, but it's as if it's connected to Cetus, and Cetus is, is a sea monster representing Satan, and it's as if he's dragging the band down, like, it's like, like they're, they're going to the deep. And, and so... Uh, you, you can't see this in the in the constant in the format we had, but this is why it's significant that this star that we just looked at here uh, I'm going one more time up now let's see if that'll work. yeah, the band or bridle it's as if the fish are tied somehow to this sea monster that's dragging it down. And it's, in our mind, it would be like we are tied to sin in some fashion. And Satan is, uh, we're tempted by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil, in this case, or Satan being representative of the sea monster. So that's, that has to do with the band. Now, this is going to be the, it, I, I've been looking forward to get to this part. And it has to do with Andromeda. Do you all remember what Andromeda looked like? The woman with the chains on. Uh, Andromeda is again an uh, illustration of being in bondage and affliction and then redeemed. The Hebrew name for Andromeda is the chained. That's what uh, uh, the Hebrew name for Andromeda means, the chain. The ancient names of the stars give, uh, gives witness to the original purpose of the constellation and that being Israel in bondage. Now I think... Let's see if I'm on the right. Let me see if I have. Yeah, here it is. Here is Andromeda, another shot of Andromeda. Well, where did that come from? Well, again, i sorry. I have to go through this the way it is. What we've seen. We'll get to Andromeda here. This is just showing where Pisces is located. Remember Pegasus was right here, the great horse Christ is returning on, and here's Pisces right underneath it here. And Cetus under that. Now here is Andromeda. Um, see the chains on her feet here and chains here? Now these show like they're hooked, like she's still chained. The one that we saw earlier was, wasn't chained. And then we have some star names for Andromeda. This one here is Al-Ma'ak, A-L-M-A-A-K, means struck down. This one, the next one here is Mirach, M-I-R-A-C-H, and it means the weak. And then we have Al-Faretz, Al A-L-P-H-E-R-A-T-Z, and it means the broken, the one that is cast down. So what we get, in the image that we get here and it's mainly referring to Israel, is that Israel, there has been times when she was weak, when she was broke down. And this happens when they were disobedient to God and ignored God, then God would turn the heat up. 
and go in five cycles. If you don't obey, then I'm going to do this. And if you still don't obey, I'm going to turn up the heat. I'm going to do this. And it continues five times until by the fifth time, the fifth cycle of discipline, and they went out uh, as a nation completely. Now in Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 17, it says, Therefore you shall say this word to them. This is Jeremiah 14, 17. Therefore you shall say this word to them. Let my eyes flow with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been broken with a mighty stroke and with a very severe blow. This is referring to uh, Israel when she was experiencing the wrath of God. Now turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 51. What we're going to see in Isaiah 51, we're going to start with verse 21, Isaiah 51, 21, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're going to read all the way to Isaiah 52, 2, and what we're going to see here is this, this in text is prophesying what the stars were saying. This, if, if you go to Pisces in the Bible, you say, okay, where in the Bible would I find what is being uh, signified in Pisces? Where would I find that in text in the Bible? Well, here's one of the places here. And we start with verse 17. Rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs. So this is describing Israel who was under the judgment of God for disobedience. And it's as if they're drinking from the cup of God's anger and he's disciplining them. Verse 18. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has borne, nor is there one to take her by the hand among all the sons she had reared. There are two things, or these two things have befallen you, who will mourn for you, and the devastation and the destruction, the famine and the sword. So you've got it covered. They're experiencing all of these things. They're under great discipline here. He says, how shall I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They are helpless at the head of every street, like an antelope in a net, full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of, of your God. Now, this is talking about when they were under judgment. Verse 21 changes. Look at this. Therefore, please hear the, this, you afflicted who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, even your God, who contends for his people. Now we have God, instead of contending, contending with his people, he's contending for them. Because God uses uh, uh, pagan nations throughout history to discipline e uh, Israel. But now he's going to contend with those that he used that were persecuting Israel. Verse uh, goes on to say, Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger, who you will never... And you will never drink it again. So it was as if they were drinking, as they were being disciplined. It signified by them drinking out of a cup of God's anger. And they were under great, severe suffering. But he's taking that out of, out of their hand. And now he's going to give it to those who are persecuting them. Verse 23. And I will put it into the hand of your tormentors. Who have said to you, lie down that, you may, that we may walk over you. You have even made your back like the ground and like the street for those who walk over you. Today we would use that terminology as saying they were a doormat uh, for the nations who were abusing them. But now chapter 52 verse 1. Awake, awake, clothe yourself in the strength, O Zion. 
Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will no more come into you. Now this is referring to the pagan nations. Shake yourself from the dust and rise up, O captive Jerusalem. Lose yourself from, loose yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And so what we're seeing here is what we, is depicted in uh, Andromeda is that she was chained, but the chains are broken now, and God is going to pour his wrath out on those who have persecuted her all that time. Now, Andromeda's chains are broken, and she will be delivered from bondage and affliction. When Israel disobeyed God, he would punish them and have no mercy on them. But he will never abandon his people forever. Now these verses, the next few verses I'm going to give you, you might want to uh, jot down at least their location. Because these are verses that contradict the idea that Israel has, re uh, excuse me, that the church has replaced Israel. We have not. He has, God has his plan for Israel and he has his plan for the church and we haven't replaced them. Romans chapter 11 verse 1 and 2. I say then, God has, I say then, has God cast away his people? And then, certainly not, exclamation point. For I also am an Israelite, this is Paul speaking, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Psalm chapter 94, verse 14. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. Psalm 89, 31 through 37. I want you to turn to that one. Psalm 89. Can y'all see what these, can y'all see good enough to read with the lights out? I need to turn them on. Turn them on, George. There you go. We're going to Psalm 89, verse 31. And again, this is depicting what both Pisces, the band, and Andromeda. All of these are talking about being in bondage, being, being uh, latched to a band, constricted, but then essentially uh, being free. Psalm 89, verse 31. If they break my statutes, it's referring to Israel, and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod. Uh, let me stop there for just a second. I probably shouldn't digress and get off on this little rabbit trail, but I'm going to very shortly. And what triggered me was the word rod, because I don't know if you've heard that I th it's some, it's some Midwestern state, I don't know if it was Nevada, some school district had passed the, the rules that parents, if they give permission to their teachers, the teachers can spank the children. And, of course, this is, there, there was an uproar about this. And they were, every place that I see, everyone that I heard and commented about this, think this is absolute brutality. And they use words like this is uh, committing violence on the children. Well, they don't even, see, this verbicide. They don't even use the words correctly because uh, violence is when you purposely try to injure someone. It has nothing to do with um, putting little, pain on the bottom side to straighten somebody out that's incorrigible. incorrigible. And so uh, the Bible in various places, especially in Proverbs, it talks about using the rod of discipline for your children. And I, just, I don't know about you, but I just get so tired of people thinking, we're in the 21st century, now we're very sophisticated, and we don't go back to all these barbaric things. Well, what I weigh all that balderdash against is the Word, is the Bible. And God says, if you don't use the rod diligently, then you hate your child. And it really, that's true. Because if you have children, and they're a bunch of little climbing, uh, curtain climbing rug rats, ankle biters and the, such, and you don't, at times, if it's necessary, use the, the rod, because this is just one form of discipline. It's not the only one. But sometimes it's the, it, it will do the job like nothing else will. And for us to think, well, that's uh, brutality, 
is, is just nonsense. We are not, this is editorial, editorialized. I'm not saying you or me when I say we, but I'm talking about we as a nation. In fact, the whole world has gone berserko and they accept all this nonsense. You know, capital punishment, oh, that's brutality. A corporal punishment, oh, that's brutality. I hope that you have the doctrine to make the discernment to know that that is a bunch of hooey. It's false and everybody is buying into it, but I'm not. And I hope you don't either. Because if you're going to stand for righteousness and stand on the Word of God, then you need to make these distinctions and back it up. And the same goes with homosexuality as well. Now, that's the end of my little diatribe and my rabbit trail, but I... I feel a lot better I got that out. Okay, where are we? With the rod. <clears throat> Verse 32. Then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him. He's going to, he's going to punish Israel, but he's not going to abandon them. It says, uh, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Now he's talking about the Davidic covenant, but that's one of the four unconditional covenants made to Israel. God's not through with Israel yet. Then verse 36 says, His seed shall endure forever. Well, how can that be? Because we're talking about the seed of David. Jesus Christ, who's also know, known as the greater son of David, he will endure forever, and so will his seed. And his throne, as the sun before me, it shall be established forever like the moon, look at this, even like the faithful witness in the sky. You might want to underline that part. Selah. Selah was a word that meant it was time for the singers to stop singing and the, and the um, instruments to take over, musical instruments. So God validated his word with his faithful witness in the sky. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Okay, um, in John chapter 8, verse 31, I think I have the um, PowerPoint for this. You can go there. Yeah, here it is. This is what I was going to show you uh, earlier. You can, you can look at it up here or you can see it in your... I don't know if I can... Can I make that bigger? Let me try to... Because that's uh, not as large as I would like to see it. Well, I tell you what. I'm going to leave it like it is because I'm afraid if I start uh, fiddling with it, that it might disappear. Okay, John chapter 8, verse 31. Now, again, we have a very interesting um, discourse with Jesus Christ. He's talking to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees always thought they knew it all, and they were always trying to uh, talk to him in a condescending fashion. And in the middle of this, Jesus is going to say something to the people who had believed his message and then we're going to have the Pharisees chime back in with their nonsense. So, John eight thirty one. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. He had been giving the gospel out and some of the Jews had believed in him and he was addressing them. And he says, if, and this is a third class condition, if, meaning maybe you will and maybe you won't. If you abide in my word, underline that, abide in my word. What is Christ making the issue here? Abiding in the word. And abiding means you camp out there. It's, it's minnow and it means you're going to be there for a, a, for a while. So if you do this, if you abide in my word as you are this morning, then you are my disciples indeed. Some say you are truly my disciples. Now, not all believers are disciples. And we're not talking about uh, disciples like Christ had 12 disciples. In, in a way, we are. But the word disciple here means uh, a pupil, someone who is studying under someone else. The Greek word there is mathetes, and it means someone who is studying under and is uh, pattering, 
patterning their life after someone. This is a disciple. So he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, if you do that. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now you've all heard that before. You may, Some buildings have it over their doorway, some universities and so forth. But the thing that this truth is linked to is what we call Bible doctrine. It's the content of the word. And if you want to be free in this life, and we are in... There are so many ways that people are in bondage and don't even know it. And this is going to come out in this discourse with the Pharisees. They didn't think they were in bondage either. But Christ is telling these people who had believed in him, they are now uh, part of God's family. And he is saying, uh, if, if you're going to be my disciples, or if you're going to abide in my word, then you're going to be my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and truth shall set you free. Now, in verse 33, make sure you make this notation. It's as if he was talking to... He, and you'll, Prior to the verses we're going to go, that we're going over this morning, he was talking to these Pharisees, and they were always... Nye, 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 nye. You know, they always... Whatever he said, nye, nye, no, 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 no. Uh, and so this is what you have here. So he said something very important, and it was... Uh, a phenomenal statement. It's really a promise that you can be a disciple and if you're a disciple, then that truth that you're learning from the Word is going to set you free. And then chime in the Pharisees. They, the Pharisees, answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? This is just, I can just hear the sarcasm and see they're they're insulted that jesus christ would say hey you that have been born again you you are uh, you're now a child of god and now you're set free you're set free from the penalty of sin for one thing and you can be set free from all these other things in life if third class condition you abide in my word so they don't like it but here's the fact. Uh, the Jews were in bondage to Egypt for 430 years. They were taken into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. They were under the bondage of the distortions of the Mosaic Law when Christ was giving them this because the rabbis and the Jews, the Judaism, added hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules and taboos and things that were not in the Mosaic Law. And they were under that. So, in a, listen, you, you think it's hard now in, in, in the society we, we live in now? Under the Mosaic Law, with the distortions that were added to it, you were just, well, let's just say you were in slavery. And they were under Roman occupation at the time Christ was speaking. And yet they said they had never been in bondage to anyone. And that's the problem with people. Even when you're talking to an unbeliever, he doesn't understand that he is in bondage to his old sin nature. He doesn't understand that he is in bondage to his own emotions and his arrogance. We're all in under bondage and nobody wants to acknowledge it. And they certainly didn't. They were. It was an affront to them when Christ told them that... Uh, the truth would set them free. Now, in verse 34 through 36, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly. Now, when he says truly, truly, it's like saying, Now hear this. This is an important per point. Perk up your ears. Make a note of this. I say to you, everyone who commits sin, and this commits is a participle. It's a present active participle. And it means to keep on committing sin. It's a present active participle to everyone. And see, he's not speaking just to them. Now he's making a specific statement. He was talking to those who had believed in a personal way up to verse 33, 31 through 33. Now he makes it just a general statement. Not just Jews, anyone who commits sins, present tense, is the slave of sin, and is is a present active indicative as well. Keeps on being a slave to sin. And it's in the Greek, it has the definite article before 
sin, and so it's talking about the sin, it's talking about the old sin nature. And this is across the board. Now let me ask you a question, and you can say it in your own mind, I don't want to hear any answer, but uh, does this apply just to unbelievers? If you continue to practice sin, does it mean that you are under slavery to your old sin nature? Is that just for unbelievers or is that for believers as well? It's for believers as well, isn't it? Because when you believe in Jesus Christ and you're eternally saved at that point, do you ever sin again after that? Of course we do. And if you, see, we have volition. We can make choices. And if you continue to sin, then it means you're in bondage to your old sin nature. And we shouldn't be. Because Romans chapter 6 says, When Christ died on the cross, we died with him as well unto sin. I'll get to that more if I have time. Verse 35. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Now what is this talking about? What Christ is... He's just talking about slavery. And so he's saying... If you are a slave, let's say in the time this was written, and you were in the house, you were a house slave, you weren't going to be there forever because it might be uh, very likely, very possible that you might be sold to someone else and you wouldn't be in the house all the time. You wouldn't be there because you would go to somewhere else. But if you were a son, you do remain in the house forever. You understand what he's saying there? There's a security there. Verse 36, so if the Son, now this, I think, correctly makes it a capital S here, talking about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, makes you free. If you're free, and He freed you from the penalty of sin when you accepted Jesus Christ, then you, are, you will be free indeed. And that means that you don't have to worry about being kicked out of the house because now you're a family member. That's essentially what He's saying. Jesus has set us free from the penalty of sin on the cross. We are set free from the power of sin by retroactive positional truth. Now, you know, I say that, and if you've never heard that before, you just, I don't know what that means, so I'm just going to turn the lights out for a, a, a short time until he starts talking about something I understand. And it's a, it, it's a fairly deep doctrine. But let me just say, in, in Romans chapter 6, it talks about retroactive positional truth. All that means is that it says, when Christ died on the cross, you died as well. In a figurative sense. Can a dead man commit sin? He can't, can he? And what happened is not only were our sins judged on the cross, and we, it's impossible for us to be judged for them because Christ was already judged for them, the law of double jeopardy. But we also, something else happened that some people don't realize is that the complete and total um, domination of the old sin nature over you was broken. Because you have something now that you didn't have before. You have a human spirit. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now you have something that you didn't have before that counters the dictatorship of the old sin nature. And that's what this post, this uh, retroactive positional truth means. And so you don't have to submit to temptation. You have a power that you didn't have before. But unbelievers don't have that power. They're spiritually dead. Therefore, they can only produce two things. Human good, which is unacceptable to God, and sin from the source of their old sin nature. So, the slave does not remain in the house forever. And... He, he is free indeed. So, we're set free from the power of sin. The power of sin, a lot of that power, is in your old sin nature. There's, there's this something within us that is normal. Right, let me put it this way. Our default mode is being sinful. To be selfish. To be arrogant. To be unkind. This, this is our normal self. And this is contrary. Can you understand why people already are not going to say that they need to be free? Because they don't see themselves that way. 
The Bible says that the human heart is desperately wicked. But people are saying, oh, well, we're getting better. Uh, we're, it, it's all a human work, which God rejects. So, and, and the indwelling and the filling of the Holy Spirit, and one day we will be set free from the presence of sin when we receive our resurrection body. So when he's saying, you are free indeed, means he's already, as believers, we're already uh, free from the penalty of sin. None of us are going to receive any punishment of the lake of fire. None of that. That's, that's gone. And from the power of sin now, are you realizing it in your life? You can. It's available to you. And someday, as a believer, you will be free from the presence of sin, but as long as we're in these bodies, we'll, we're going to have to stick it out. Stick it out and battle that old sin nature. Okay. Now, boy, I want to go on this. Are y'all still fresh enough? Are y'all... Huh? You don't hurt my feelings if you say, well, the air's going. It's, it's running right now. I see some of you are warm. Maybe that's why some of you look kind of... Everybody stand up. You're going to stand up in a minute anyway. You might as well stand up now. Go ahead and stand up. Let's take a few <sighs> big breaths. <sighs> big breaths. Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. Seventh inning stretch. Some of you thought we were in the last of the ninth. Some of you were maybe hoping we were in the last of the ninth. Well, we're probably in the ninth, but not in the... Okay, go ahead and sit down. Now, I want you to be ready for this next part. You know, millions of believers are in bondage today. But we don't call it bondage, do we? We call it addiction. People are addicted to alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, prescription drugs, Marijuana, cocaine, heroin, that's a short list, by the way, video games, gambling, texting, I know y'all giggle, a bunch of old fogies here, we don't, I, could, I don't even know how to text, I'm, I'll assure you. Uh, and my fat fingers on those little devices don't work that good anyway. But those kids, that some kids send hundreds of texts a day. I'm not picking on the kids, but I have to make, make this relevant for some of us older folks because they don't even know what texting is. Surfing the internet, pornography, television, Junk food, Facebook, and Twitter. That kind of goes in the same thing with texting for some of us. Uh, football, soap operas, and I could go on and on and on. And I'm talking about addictions. There's some guys that probably ought to just have a porta potty in the in the den where the TV is because they don't want to stop when they have to go to miss even one play. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. You see how this Pisces has a relevancy in several areas and the reason is because we are in bondage in several areas. And many, many, many people, even Christians, have addictions. And they don't want to hear it. They don't want to acknowledge that they are addicted to something. Just pretend it's just a kind of a habit, but it's not an addiction. And these two verses, I have two verses that I'm going to end. 1 Corinthians 6.12 All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. 
This is talking about the law of liberty. And as a believer, we are really free, excuse me, free to do anything we want as long as it doesn't break one of God's commandments or one of his rules or harm someone else. Uh, we don't want to uh, infringe on the rights of other people or harm them in any way. But we're not under the Mosaic law. We don't have to have da 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 all these things. We have discernment and we have the Holy Spirit. And so we have the law, to, I mean the freedom to do uh, things as long as we don't hurt other people. And when it says all things are lawful for me, that's what it's talking about. It doesn't mean that, well, I'm a Christian, I can go and uh, rob a bank because the Bible says all things are lawful to me. We're putting it in context. It's talking about uh, we're not under this bondage of this law, Mosaic law. But not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. No Christian should. Because we have a power in us that keeps us from being mastered by something else, being enslaved to something else. But I'll give you an example. I'll just give you a quick one. Some people think that the Bible says if you drink any alcohol, it's a sin, and that's not true. The Bible does not condemn believers from drinking alcohol. The Bible condemns drunkenness, but not drinking alcohol. But now you might have a, a, someone in the family that is a teetotaler, and they're very legalistic, and you're having them over for Thanksgiving dinner, and where you might want to have a little wine in there, you know, wine glasses, pour a little wine. And if that is going to make them stumble, if they're going to get all upset over that, you have to put a lid on that liberty of knowing it's not a sin and to imbibe like that in order to not be a stumbling block for them. So in that case, it would be wrong to drink when it's going to offend someone else. But if you're addicted to that, it's not going to matter what anybody thinks. You understand? I don't give a hoot what they want. I got to have my booze or whatever it may be. As an example, we're not to be mastered by anything. One, here's the last one we're going to go over today. And turn to 2 Peter 2.18. 2 Peter 2 Peter is talking about false teachers and uh, people who are off track. 2 Peter 2.18 says, For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensualities, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. Verse 19, Promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. Now here's the last part, what I want you to look at. For by what a man is overcome... By this, he is enslaved. By what a man is overcome. What, what, if you're overcome by something, and we all have an area of weakness, that we have a proclivity to some, uh, something that we ought not do. And they're different. You know, yours and mine are probably not the same, but we all have that. And we, we, have to, we have to constantly fight that in order to uh, keep from being enslaved by it. Because if you give in, and you continue to give in, and give in, and give in, and give in, then you're addicted to it. And Christ has set us free. We don't have to continue to be controlled, and what this is saying here, overcome and enslaved by something. I just want to leave you with that note, that we don't have to, because Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think that's a good verse to end on. There are all these dangers, and we can be addicted to something. It doesn't have to be a narcotic. And I, what I gave you was just a short list. Some people, I said junk food. Uh, some people might be uh, ad addicted to snow cones. I don't, I don't know, just something out of the air. Uh, and they've got to have their snow cone. And whenever you cannot control yourself and something is controlling you, then spiritually you're in trouble and you don't have to be and we need to ask God to help us overcome whatever it is that is 
plaguing us. For some people, it might be a, a temper, anger. And they continually give themselves permission to be uh, angry and just lash out at people. And it can be an addiction. And we all need to be able to fight that. So uh, we're going to end there today. Like everyone, please bow your heads, close your eyes at this last portion of, this, of time because uh, there may be someone here or online that um, may not know how to get to heaven. They might not know what is going to happen to them after they die. And they need to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And He went to the cross and He took care of your sin problem and my sin problem because God poured out all of the judgment on Him. So now He is the issue. He rose from the grave and now He offers eternal life to anyone who will trust Him and Him alone for eternal salvation. And that means in a moment of time, you can understand the issue clearly and stop depending on your own work, stop trying to um, be acceptable to God through your own efforts and depend on the Lord Jesus Christ and His work on the cross. And in that moment, you are born again. You become a royal family member of God. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed. Now, Father, we're thankful for not only your written word, but your witness in the sky as well. We pray that we will think about these things, utilize your scriptures in order to give us the victory that you would have us have. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.